In 2017, um, when Bitcoin prices were reaching their sort of second bubble, um, an ex-student of mine, Lewis Tesla, decided we, uh, that it would be a good idea to do a project on examining the vulnerabilities of uh, Bitcoin and quantum computing. So uh, we released this paper on the archive um, in late 2017, and we were quite early in the game for this paper. At this time, there were not so many papers on Bitcoin and quantum computing, but since then, uh, especially with the Bitcoin prices going up as they are now in 2021, um, there are a huge number of articles uh, talking about how and whether quantum computing will actually you know, uh, compromise some of the uh, securities that Bitcoin has. But actually, there's, there's quite a lot of different articles and there are sort of two types of articles where there are the, the camp of people where Bitcoin, where they say that Bitcoin isn't actually so much of a threat, and there are actually articles that say they are. So uh, there's a lot of confusion out there. So today what we're going to do is to talk a little bit about uh, how um, of our analysis of whether Bitcoin really is vulnerable to quantum computers. And to do that today we've got Marek. Um, and he's going to talk a bit about uh, quantum attacks on blockchains. Okay. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to episode one of the quantum attacks on blockchain. Uh, let's start with a little introduction. Uh, today I'm going to uh, present to you uh, some introductory information uh, regarding the subject of quantum attacks to blockchain, particularly uh, quantum 51% attack. But first, we will explain how cryptocurrencies work very briefly and give some short introductions. So let's get it started. Uh, we will uh, first clarify what's the difference between classical computers and quantum computers. Uh, the difference between cryptocurrencies and conventional currencies, and finally, uh, what quantum computers have to do with all this. So, let's take it away. Uh, regarding the difference between classical and quantum computers, all you need to know here is that uh, for classical computers, which have classical state, you can, a classical state can have only one value at a time, so either the big dodge or the small dodge. But for the quantum computers, they can have quantum states and they can be in superposition of many outcomes. So big dodge is like one and small dodge is zero? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, there, there should be a cat there, <laughs> okay. but right. I didn't have it. And the quantum computers are governed by Schrodinger wave equation. And that's it, that's all. That's all we're going to say about this regarding the cryptocurrencies and conventional currencies. For the conventional currencies, there usually, there, there is uh, the notion of the central trust. So there is a central trusted party that governs the way currency works, their monetary policies and all sorts of things decided centrally. And for cryptocurrencies, the central party, the central authority is replaced by the consensus algorithm. So now, as you can see, every participant of the network has a computer and what happens is decided by the algorithm instead in a decentralized way. And what quantum computers have to do with that? So since, since what happens is decided by a computer, what if someone has a computer that could be superior in certain ways? Could that person like hack the whole system, hack the consensus algorithm? So that's the subject of this talk. First, let's talk about cryptocurrencies a bit. Uh, explain what is blockchain, what is consensus, what is mining, and all those things. So the blockchain is a chain of blocks. Every block can store some data, it could be transactions, could be 
some medical records, could be anything. And the important information is that every consecutive block stores a hash of the previous block. So there is, it makes it immutable. It, it makes it really impossible to put a block somewhere in the middle because that would invalidate all the future blocks. So hashes the entire block or some part of it? Or? So the part of the block contains a hash of the entire previous block. And this way, this way there is really no way to change something in the middle without changing literally everything later on. And the way we add a block, a new block, is the matter of consensus because since there is no central authority, everyone has to agree on what the next block is. So we can imagine that we have some current chain, we have some data to put in this chain. In this case, it's ABC. Those could be, for example, transactions. And there are network participants who are in charge of creating new blocks. We call them miners. And as you can see in this network of miners, each one of them has a different idea for what the next block could be. And that, it, that is what we solve using the consensus. So for proof of work consensus, each one of the miners have to solve some hard puzzle, some hard problem using the using the mine block as the input. And the one who manages to find it first gets to choose what the next block is. And once in a while it might occur that more than one miner finds the block and then there is a dispute. As you can see, the, the chain sort of forks. Now we have two chains. And the way those forks get resolved is at some point, due to limited um, resources, computational resources, uh, other miners will have to choose to which branch they want to append and mine new blocks. And <clears throat> because, because they, they have limited computational resources, they would naturally prefer to mine blocks on the longest branch. So the shorter branch will naturally die out. And in order to motivate miners to mine new blocks, they get offered the block reward, which is they get some coins for finding a new block. And the, as you might imagine, the problem could occur if, if someone has computational power equal or above half of the network, that such person could become a central authority and basically decide what future blocks could be because it would outperform everyone else. And this is the this is the 51% attack. So but here we are going to talk about the quantum 51% attack. So how to outperform the network using quantum approaches, quantum technologies. So for that we will talk a little bit about about hashes, about Grover's algorithm, and also quantum mining again. So <clears throat> the way the way hash function works is it accepts some input and provides an, uh, some arbitrary length input and provides some fixed length output. You can imagine it being a function that accepts anything and gives you a number. So the, the puzzle that miners solve is they try to find a hash uh, of a block. So they add a value to the block called nonce. They try to find nonce such that the hash of the block will be below the block target difficulty. And the, the particular hash function we talk about here is the SHA-256. So is it, is it even possible to speed it up using quantum algorithms? And one of the poss a possibility would be using Grover's algorithm, which is a search quantum search algorithm. 
imagine you have a high stack and a needle hidden somewhere in it. Uh, a high stack would be like unsorted set of elements, and one of those elements is the element you want. Since they are unsorted in any way, the worst case scenario, you have to check each one of them. So if there's n elements, in the worst case scenario, you have to do n checks. However, if you have quantum computer and apply Grover's algorithm, you could potentially do it using square root of n checks due to quantum properties. So the way Grover's algorithm works is uh, there are two essential operators, the oracle operator and the diffusion operator. The oracle operator indicates the eigenstates which represent uh, the, the target solutions and it pulls out negative phase to those eigenstates. And the diffusion operator is basically amplifying those little differences. So if you, if you apply those operators square root of n times, you reach high probability of measuring the target state. So potentially you could construct a Hilbert space in which eigenstates are hashes and you could project certain number of zeros in the end to enforce the value to be lower than difficulty, pull out the negative phase on those eigenstates, and that would be your that would be your oracle function for reversing the the hash function. This is of course subject to 32 byte block size. It would be more complicated for larger block sizes. And as Tim already said, the Lewis and Tim made little analysis on this problem just to compare the success probability and affordability of such quantum mining. And in both cases, the, the, the factor one could be potentially in control of is the hash rate. For the classical miner, that would be the classical hash rate, and for the quantum miner, that would be the quantum hash rate, which in this case is number of Grover iterations per second. And this is where actually I believe that classical mining has an advantage because this problem is highly parallelizable. You can you can add many of those hardware hash computers in parallel and they don't need to interact at all and you can increase this probability. However, it, it is much more difficult to add more Grover iterations for a quantum computer and it gives you only quadratic speed up compared to classical search uh, using the classical miners and you you have limited time to find the block because at least in case of Bitcoin, there is a new block every 10 minutes and you would probably need to find a trade-off and have more quantum computers and run them to a lower success probability and hope one of them would find the, the valid block. So eventually you would run into the same problem that you would need more and more hardware for mining, just like in the classical case. However, the hardware is much more expensive. So in my opinion, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, at least in terms of 51% attack, are completely safe from <laughs> quantum computers, at least for a very long time. Could you maybe say a bit more about that dynamic of the, the 10 minutes? Yes. Yeah. So the way, the way it works is those, those miners, they, they compete to find the next block. And it could occur that one of them has much stronger machine than others and finds the block faster. But the network 
wants the block every 10 minutes, doesn't want the block faster than 10 minutes, in order to ensure the network to adapt to a superior computational power, this difficulty factor T would be adjusted so that even more powerful actor would still need 10 minutes to find the block. So assuming that quantum computers become widely available and everyone starts to mine using Rover's algorithm, um, network would find significantly larger T to adapt for this quadratic speed up and mining would continue using quantum machines. So the 10 minutes, so the sine squared comes from the fact that in Grover's algorithm, you know, you need to repeat the algorithm several times and then mm -hmm. it gradually converges to the um, correct, you know, answer in, the, in mm -hmm. the Grover's algorithm, right? So, so the, you know, I remember the Lewis, Lewis did this analysis of, so you have to have, you have, to, you can only, you've only got 10 minutes to do that search yeah. and um, even if this sine squared is kind of small, mm -hmm. you basically have to quit your search, which basically means it's going to be a kind of a probabilistic yes. um, you That's know, true. Yeah, aspect anyway. But at least for that time, you're still getting that benefit of that square root. Right? I mean, classical miners also suffer for the problem of having only 10 minutes to find the mm -hmm. log. However, their advantage is they just have a solution in sort of real time. Mm. Once the block is there, they know it immediately. Yes. But for a quantum machine, you know nothing until you measure. And you need to know when is the mm. good time to measure. You want to run it as long as possible, yeah. maximize the fidelity, but not too long to not be outperformed by the classical miners at the same time. And, and this thing on the right you have is the probability, right? Yeah. yeah. So that somehow if you, at smaller times, because sine is mm -hmm. like linear, right? Yeah. And then you actually kind of lose that quadratic, mm -hmm. is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it kind of only really helps if you're at least sort of, you know, part way in that Grover swing that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I imagine you would need probably a lot of those quantum miners because the square root of 2 to the power of 256 is still very big mm. search space. Mm. Okay, all right. So in part two, what are you going to talk about? In part two, if the pilot episode is going <laughs> to pass, I'm going to talk about different kind of attack which consists of breaking the digital signature so that a malicious actor owning a quantum computer could produce transaction uh, using someone else's coins by forging this person's signature. Okay, good. And uh, we might talk to Lewis at some point as well, so it might even be a part three. Oh, that would yeah. be really great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thanks Thank for listening. Thank you for your attention. Bye. Like and subscribe.